Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Well, I'm curious. That's You're curious. Yeah. I'm, cu- I'm, cu- I'm pretty curious too. Okay. So, so, so who do I have the pleasure of talking to? Well, my name is uh, Joy, Joy Kagawa, K O G A W A. Okay. And I'm a writer. Marvelous. What type of things do you write? This is um, this novel is what I'm best known for. Uh, Obasan. I have Obasan. Uh, it's been taught a fair bit. Here's another one. They're in his hands. I've written poetry too. Here's another one. That's how I used to look. <laughs> okay. Anyway. And and tell me. Obasan is what is it, what is it about? Well, it's a it's a novel, but it's um, semi autobiographical in that it uh, deals with what happened to Japanese Canadians in 1942 when the war with Japan was on. All the Japanese Canadians were moved out of the West Coast and were scattered across the country. And uh, so when I when that happened, I was about six or seven years old. So I grew up with this notion that this people we were we were considered at the time to the most despicable people in the world. You know who the Japanese? It was the war, and so I grew up with that. And um, so that that in a way is what this book is about, Obasan, uh, about the family being sent away from their home. Everybody was, all the Japanese Canadians were sent away from their homes and uh, scattered across the country. Our family ended up going into the mountains. And then after the war was over, we still couldn't go back home. So that's when we, um, our family ended up in Southern Alberta, where a lot of the Japanese Canadians were sugar beet workers. And it was a lot worse than it was in the United States. Because um, after the war in the United States, people were able to go home. That wasn't the case in Canada. So th- this is a book about that, about a life of one family. Wow. I, I mean, this sounds like a trite question, but I'm going to ask you. Yeah. What, does it, what did it feel like to be completely what? ostracized by the country of your, of your birth? Well, um, when you're a child, whatever happens to you is the only reality you know. So everything that you're going through, even if you're in the middle of a war or whatever it is, when you're a child, that's just normal. So um, I grew up with that. And there was an ethic amongst the immigrant generation, the people that came from Japan, there was a, a word for it, gaman, which means you endure. And shikataganai, which means you just deal with whatever it is. You don't fight it. You just accept it and you endure. And so that generation passed on those virtues, or we, we might consider them not so virtuous today because we believe in activism. But, but the Japanese Canadians didn't have any political power to work with to make a difference. So they just went into themselves, endured it, didn't complain, lived. And then when we were scattered across the country, that's what happened. We were scattered across the country. The injunction was that we were never to be a community again. And so unlike the United States, I think that my generation that grew up with that injunction are um, a lot less cohesive in the, in a sense of, of Japanese Canadian community anyway, and were the the intermarriage rate for Japanese Canadians was something like ninety five percent or something like that. They, we we there was kind of self hatred, and so when you get to the third and the fourth generation, um, the children you you can't see any Japanese in them; it's all gone. And so the Japanese in, in this country now that are Japanese would be uh, and be seen to be Japanese would be immigrants from Japan. They don't have that background. And so they don't have that self-hatred and the need to disappear. Hmm. 
That sounds awful. Tell me, were you um, put in an internment camp? Yeah. Um, the one we went to was, well, my, my dad was an Anglican minister, and so they, we were divided up by faith. You know, there was the Anglicans, there was the United Church people, there were the Buddhists who were in the worst place, which is a place called Sandon. It was uh, a hole in the mountains without, without much sunlight, you know, that's where they went. And um, there were other centers. Um, they were really familiar to me by the, the sound of them because uh, what my dad did during the war was he, he was desperate to keep people connected. And, and so I can remember every month we would send out what he called the church news. But it just connected people, you know, said little bits, tidbits of, oh, this person got, got a new baby, these people died, that kind of thing, you know, so that people could be in touch in some kind, kind of way. And what were some of your memories of being in an internment camp as a child? Well, I had lots of memories, but in terms of the Japanese Canadians, what I, what I, the memories I have mostly are the work we did in trying to keep them connected, that is sending out news, newsletters. And, um, you know, my, my brother had a bike and we would pile his bike up high with all these things that we did. So it was a lot of work involved. But, but what I loved about Slow Can, and I was six, seven, eight, nine years old, and it's a, that, that's a, almost a magical time of childhood where, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of those years where you remember everything and uh, so we were in the mountains I loved the mountains you know and going picking the fiddleheads and and climbing up the bluffs and there was one bluff two miles up called Mickey's Bluff and I'd love to go there and stand on that ledge and look out you could see see the you know you could see Bay Farm which which had these rows and rows of houses in them and you see the smoke going up you could see the river you could see the lake you could see the little tiny flowers I loved it and the thing is that my my and all the parents were like this everything there was a phrase kodomo no tame kodomo no tame which means for the sake of the children the, nobody was going to try to harm the children's um, spirituality or their sense of dignity or any of that. So there was no complaining. It was just the protection of the, the spiritual um, heritage of the kids by um, remaining calm, by not, I mean, there's no drama, um, no fighting, no resisting, uh, just a kind of steady enduring. So I grew up with that, and uh, I wasn't aware of anything being out of the way, or that was just ordinary. That's how I grew up. So, in essence, your childhood, even though it was in an internment camp, was actually quite a good one because you were a kid, and the and the adults had a philosophy of making sure that the kids were okay. Exactly. That's exactly right. The thing was, though, that when the war was over, because we and I we lived in a in a real house, you know, when we were in Vancouver, it was a house with lots of windows. I loved that house. I longed to go back. I dreamed of going back. I loved it so much. But then I understood after we were sent away from Vancouver after the war, that wasn't going to happen. So at some point, the longing, you know, got suppressed. But um, because after the war, um, we went into southern Alberta, which is very fierce. I mean, it was very, very hot in the summer and very cold and blizzardy and windy all the time. And um, so it was fierce. And the, and the ground, uh, it was a gumbo kind of mud that was there. And uh, we lived in the swamp in that sense that... And so if you went outside, your boots got covered with this thick gumbo clay and you got heavy walking. Um, but And you had to walk to get your water and all of that. It's so different from life in Vancouver where we had running water and bathroom and all the rest of it. And we lived in that house after that, after, after, um, after the war. It was hard. 
And the people that lived out in the beet fields had it very hard because that was the labor of, of thinning and weeding and irrigating and all of that kind of labor. The kids, I was lucky that I could go to school, but a lot of the kids were taken out of school to do the work. So it was tough. I think back on that, and I'm glad to have known about it and to have been protected at one level to understand the power of um, that per- per- my parents' generation in their care and in their love for their kids. When did you realize that you spent your childhood in an internment camp? And once you did realize, how did you feel? Well, I never thought of it. Uh, when you think of internment camp, you think about the Holocaust, and you think of uh, people being crowded together and suffering. and that. That's not the way it was. I mean, we lived in the mountains. The people that lived in the rows and rows and rows of houses, of course, had another experience. They didn't have water. They had to, you know, all of that. But I guess my childhood was privileged in that um, I came from a clergy family, and we've had a little log cabin to to have to live in. But when did I realize there was anything wrong with that? Not till I was an adult. Not till I um, had some kind of take on justice and the world and what's Canadian citizenship and all of those kinds of questions. That none, none of that was part of my childhood. I just accepted this is life. And when you actually figured it out that there was so much injustice, how did you feel? Yeah. Well, this is this is what this book tells all that. Obasan. Um, Obasan. Yeah. It's become it's become a classic, and uh, it's been taught a fair bit. But it's it's an old book now. It's written. It was published in 1981, but anyway, it marches on, <laughs> and. Um, anyway. So can you explain what the book is about? Like in as yeah. much detail as you can. Well, let me see. I mean, it's bookended. The bookends are the prairies. It begins on the prairies and it ends on the prairies. And um, at the be- it, it begins in the 1970s. And then there's a flashback to um, life in Vancouver Life in the house, um, starting off going to kindergarten, going to grade one, and then the sudden shift away from that. And I was mostly we were living in a nice neighborhood in in Vancouver called Marpole. My house, by the way, has been saved and is a writer's residence now, and it's still there, fourteen fifty West Sixty Fourth Avenue in Vancouver, and um, that. So so um, yeah. Between the bookends of 1972 on the prairies and at the end, back on the prairies, is the life of, uh, actually my life, from Socan to Southern Alberta to, to the camp of, from Vancouver to Socan to Southern Alberta. That, that's what this book is. Those okay. three lo- geogra- geographic locations. And then there's also... The story of three generations. There's the Obasan, who is the, the the person who belongs to the first generation who takes care of the children. Um, and then there is the Aunt Emily, who is a, a second generation, a niece. She's a very feisty, outspoken, aggressive woman who wants redress she wants justice she's out there fighting for it. and her her obosan character the obosan character is um is silent her she's like the bottom of the iceberg and but there's tremendous power in the in what's below the surface and that's why i mean that's why it's called obosan what is above the surface is all the action the activity the the the, the speech but the speech that frees, that I speak about it in the very beginning, in the prologue to it, um, is what saves us. And if you want to hear a brief... Yes, can you read the first day? paragraph? Definitely read the first paragraph. It'd be great. Well, this is... Um, 
this is just the prologue right here. I'll okay, just yes. Read that. Yes, please read it. There is a silence that cannot speak. There is a silence that will not speak. Beneath the grass, the speaking dreams, and beneath the dreams is a sensate sea. The speech that frees comes forth from that amniotic deep. To attend its voice, I can hear it say, is to embrace its absence, but I fail the task. The word is stone. I admit it. I hate the stillness. I hate the stone. I hate the sealed vault with its cold icon. I hate the staring into the night, <coughs> the questions thinning into space, the sky swallowing the echoes. Unless the stone bursts with telling, unless the seed flowers with speech, there is in my life no living word. The sound I hear is only sound, white sound. <clears throat> Words, when they fall, are pockmarks on the earth. They are hailstones seeking an underground stream. If I could follow that stream down and down to the hidden voice, would I come at last to the freeing word? I ask the night sky, but the silence is steadfast. There is no reply. Okay, that's what I say at the beginning here, that there's no reply. But by that time, I get to be an old woman. I've never written another book called Gently to Nagasaki. <clears throat> Gently to Nagasaki. I mean, Nagasaki, you know, was the second bomb, atom bomb that fell on this, in this planet. And there hasn't been another one like that. But um, the freeing word does come through in that book, Gently to Nagasaki. And the freeing word is trust. Well, trust is the main word, and it's still the main word in my life. It's main virtue. It's the main wherewithal by which I navigate at this stage, especially in old age, as you come to the end, as you come towards that door that's going to open and you're going to go through. The thing that will carry you through with rejoicing, with trust, is trust. And if you trust all the time, Always is the freeing word. The main word is trust. Trust always is. So that's the freeing word. And, um, and I hold that. That's one of lots of different notions that I have. But that's um, a tremendously important notion. Another notion that I have is that love expands for the work. I mean, time expands for the work of love. If you're doing the work of love in your life. You'll have enough time. That's a notion, you know, that the, the, that the necessary time is allotted to us for the works. Well, that's what we're here for anyway, as far as I can figure out, that we're here to trust, to forgive, to love, to hold truth and love together and never separate them ever. They're one thing. Truth and love have to be together always. It's like, um, abundance and mercy also. They belong together. They must not be separated. You can't have one without the other. In this world, if you're merciful, you have to have the abundance to go with it, the heart that's filled up with, um, with an abundance of good things. That's where mercy lives. Anyway, I'm rambling. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not rambling. That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> that, 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 that kind of explained... I would imagine the essence of your book. I would also imagine more, yeah. important, more importantly, it explains the essence of that little girl that was interned all those years ago, right? That like voice well, that, yeah. that wasn't able to speak and now is able to speak and spoke through that book. That's right. I can remember when, when I was seven years old and when we were living in the mountains, I used to pray every single day to know the truth and by that what i meant was i need to know about that kid that's hanging on the ledge with his fingernails and that's suffering that's terrible suffering i need to know about that and i have to see it 
Because I think when you see and you love, then you can change things. Anyway, <laughs> so. Well, that's beautiful too. When you said, when you see with love, I always tell people that we need to see with our hearts. It's, okay. easy, it's easy to see with our eyes. It's harder to see with our hearts. Um, yeah. And now I understand why the producers put you and I in touch, right? Because <laughs> yeah. you, ju you just explained kind of what I try and live by, but you explained it in a way that was so beautiful and <laughs> was so beyond like rational thought. It, it, and maybe that's why the book is, is, has become like a, a, a classic because, again, I haven't read the book, but based on the, the way you just spoke, you spoke from the deepest part of every person's humanity. And when mm -hmm. someone hears that humanity, they are attracted to it. Yeah? It's like mm -hmm. words that come from the deep. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, silence is sometimes silence is more powerful than than saying anything, right? Um, I feel like uh, giving you a hug, <laughs> but I I can't because you're over there and I'm over here, right? <laughs> but uh, I, I I I feel you. And I, uh, I see you, and uh, yeah, it's... that's great. And how, how did you, how how did you dip into that essence of everything? <laughs> you know, I think that 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 essence of everything is everywhere all the time. You know in the sense that it's accessible to us. And I think that that energy, that towards us energy, um, it's just waiting for us to recognize and to recognize and to welcome and to be part of that. And, um, and then what's happening is that when we do recognize that, and we welcome it, and we become part of it. Then we're on this long arc. And I believe that this long arc is an arc of goodness. I think that goodness underlies the reality that we um, cannot see, but I trust is there. Um, I trust in the goodness. And I think the more of it we see, the more of it we see. The more of it we see, the more of it there is, in the sense that then we recognize that, and then it expands. So, um, so we can become <clears throat> co-creators of goodness. We can become participants and and our influence on that arc. We can experience that. You know, what I love is um, what comes to us in the unconscious and through dreams and uh, through surprise. I think the hallmarks of that gift is the surprise of it. So I think we, I mean, just to be. The gift of being human, the gift of consciousness is something to be immensely grateful for, I think. <clears throat> anyway. how, do you, how, how, how do you teach people to get in touch with that essence of everything? Well, I think that this is another notion but I think that the more invisible it is, the more powerful it is. That is, we think that it, this little thought that just came through or went away, what was that? How is that of any moment? And I think we do not have the tools for measuring 
the impact of those infinitesimally small um, impulses or, you know, I, I think that we, we have very clumsy tools by which, I mean, we're like snails. We've got these feelers and we're trying to figure out which way is the wind blowing, where do we go from here? And we're kind of like, we're closer to that than we are to knowing things. And, uh, but those, those weak little feelers are the only tools we've got, whatever those are. And so we, if the more we've got, we exercise, and the more of that we're led by, the more of that we become conscious of, and the more of that there is, I think. So, um, so I mean, here I am. I'm 87 years old, and uh, in some ways, these are the happiest days of my life. You know, um, I remember as a child thinking, oh, I'll be so glad that when it's almost over, because <laughs> I saw quite a bit of suffering, but not, I mean, I just knew that there was a tremendous amount of suffering in the world. I knew that we're not going to escape that. And how do you feel now about what you felt when you were a kid that you were looking forward to it being over? <laughs> well, what did I know then, you know? Um, but I think that, you know, the, it is a journey. And when you're getting close, what is what is it to be close to the goal, to the end? end of the journey what is that i think it's to become more more of who you who we are meant to be i don't know i haven't thought about that but i like the question i'll think about that mm. and 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 who who are we meant to be I think we're meant to be one, at one, atoned. I think we're meant, I think we're, we're all, I think relationship is, is what matters to us most, I think. What do you think matters most? <laughs> um. I think being connected to each other, being connected right. to ourselves, being connected to nature, basically being in the essence of everything, right? Because clearly, you have experienced that and you continue to experience that. And I have had moments of experiencing being connected to the essence of everything. And yeah. those are in fact the greatest moments of my existence. Yes. Can you tell me about that? <laughs> I, 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 I can, I can. Um, I, I remember I've had quite a few moments like that, but I remember one moment I was in um, South America. My memory serves me correct. I was in Peru. I had just finished sand duning on a, uh, mm. on a sand surfing on a sand mm. dune. Um, and I was sitting by this beautiful harbor uh, looking out as the sun was setting. And in that moment, I needed nothing and I was everything. And I just sat there and did my best to milk the moment for as long as mm -hmm. I possibly could because I knew that there was going to be a time when I had to get back in the bus, I had to start doing whatever I had to do. And that moment of connection where I had everything you could ever want was going to go away or more to the point, I was going to lose connection to it. So 
those moments, like I said, I remember, I remember thinking to myself very clearly, in this moment, I need nothing. And I have everything. Yet all I had was the clothes on my back. That was it. And it's like when you started speaking, I can't, uh, there was a shift when you started, uh, maybe it was, I can't remember, maybe it was after you read the prologue of the book, but there was a shift when you started speaking from this place of pureness beyond words. If I just listened to the words that you were saying, I wouldn't have felt the power beneath those words. But because I've had all these experiences of traveling and feeling everything, I, I connected to it. And it was like we went from kind of up here, the conversation for the first 15 minutes maybe was mind-based. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. And we were working in this zone of the essence of everything is right here, right now. Let's go with the flow. Right? Yeah. And, and one can't have a conversation like this with, with, with many, right? But for whatever reason, you and I right now are having this conversation. And it feels to me like I've known you for billions of years. Mm -hmm. Really. Like I said, I wanted to hug you. It feels like you and I, because we had that experience, are literally one, will always be one, have always been one, will never stop being one. And the way to manifest that in the human world is to hug, mm. is to sit with this magic that's happening right now. You get it. I sense it. I get it. And sometimes to get to that place, this place that we are currently in, takes lots and lots of pain. Mm -hmm. And the way that you explained, the way the prologue, it was the prologue that took us to this new world. Because it was like, I felt it was that, you know, this is just me, I just felt like it was that kid who had suffered so much, whether she was aware of it or wasn't, and that kid's inner voice, which we all have, had broken free and had written this masterpiece of a book from her very essence of everything. Did that make any sense? Yes. Yes. You know, it's quite, it's a beautiful thing. I literally, like I said, I could probably start crying now. I won't, but it's a beautiful thing because I feel profoundly seen by you and you're not saying anything because you don't need to see someone with your words because I feel you. And I hope, irrespective of my words, that you feel that I feel you in this like magical place that one has to feel in order to truly understand. And I would go so far as to say that part of the reason why the world seems crazy is because far too few people have experiences like you and I are having right now.
And I wish, I wish that I could go back to when you were a kid and hug that eight-year-old kid and say, you know what? Everything's going to be okay. And I promise you that one day you're going to write a book that it's going to inspire millions of people simply because of what happened to you now. And you're going to share with them how important it is to turn your pain and your suffering into love. And that love is going to come from a place that one day you're going to have a conversation with an Englishman and you're going to describe it as the essence of everything. Thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing what you did. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing you did. All you did was read that one prologue to me, that one place. And I understand it's difficult to sometimes go there, right? I get it. But what a, what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing, truly. Beauty, the word beauty doesn't even give it justice. Right? Like, do you live in Canada? Yeah. So this is what we're going to do, if you're okay. Pardon? This is what we're going to do, if you're okay. When we get off the podcast, I'd like you to, I'd like you to give me your address. Okay. And I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do with it, but there's truth. You said you said the, the power was truth and love. Truth and love. Okay. So afterwards, give me your address, and uh, we're going to prove that truth and love are indeed the most powerful things that each and every one of us can be connected to. Okay. Um, okay. I see you more profoundly than you will ever know. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just, I don't know if there's any more words, to be honest with you, that you and I can share with each other that can, that can do justice to what happened over the past 20 minutes or how many minutes it was. Um, like I said, I, f I feel like I, I've known you for many, many lifetimes and that's what happens when you get connected to the essence of everything. So I, I want to, th I want to thank you. I, 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 I like, like I said, I'm, I'm lost for words. Um, you've done, you just keep, keep living the way you're living. Keep sharing your love and your truth and magic will continue to happen because magic happened on this podcast. And um, I hope that people can sense what happened and feel what happened between you and I during these beautiful moments. Um, I don't know. I, I just, it's like, I feel like you and I can just literally sit in a room together right now and say nothing to each other for seven hours and everything, <laughs> everything would be like said. Does that make sense? Of course. <clears throat> okay. So thank you so very much. Um, it was beautiful. And um, when the podcast is over, I'll, I'll get you a dress. And okay. um, just keep doing what you're doing. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello everyone, it's Leon here, aka The Kindness Guy. If you like my videos, which I hope you do, don't forget to press the subscribe button and also to ring the little bell so that the notifications notify you that I have a new video out in the world.